Marco Mangelsdorf here on Energy 808B Cutting Edge. I am so very pleased to be able to offer today our exclusive interview and talk story with one Mike Calacchini, Senior Director of Puna Geothermal Venture. And Mike, you know, you and I go back a ways. We've both been in the, uh, in the trenches here to one degree or another in the energy field. And uh, I have always had so much uh, respect and aloha for you. So first, uh, let me just give you my, my thanks so much for joining me and joining us today. Hey, I really appreciate your finesse and consideration for uh, joining you today. Mahalo. So let's, let's take a, a dive right now. I was looking at your LinkedIn bio before I started this, uh, this session. And I see you've been at Pugio Thermal, Pugio for the Thermal Venture, PGV for short. You've been there now more than 32 years, 32 years, and so worked your way up to the position you have now. So, man, you, you, you've been around since even before the first kilowatt kilowatt That's hour true. was generated because if i'm not mistaken you guys went live in 1993 right 1993. So how first kind of take a step back how did you start end up starting at pgv long ago and it was under different ownership back then right because ormat is i believe the second right. owner yeah ormat was the second owner but ormat was actually uh involved in the engineering and procurement construction they built the facility it's their equipment but then the, uh, the the owners that operated uh, was the company Constellation Energy out of uh, Maryland, yeah, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. So I see you were the, in the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service uh, before. What led you to PGV long ago? <laughs> so, I, I, so I was in the Navy. I was in the engineering department. Uh, my specialty was gas turbine engines. I was a mechanical uh, systems operator for gas turbine, which is basically a jet engine, right? And uh, on the ship that I was uh, on, we had large uh, LM2500s, General Electric jet engines that were used for main propulsion to make the boat, you know, go. We also had smaller gas turbines that uh, we used to generate electricity. So that's where I got all my experience in the engineering background is uh, the Navy. And I was stationed in San Diego, and believe it or not, I met a, a lady from uh, Hawaii Island in San Diego. So <laughs> we got married and my enlistment ended and she said, let's move back home. I said, okay, right on. And I'm from Oahu. So mm. I'm thinking, all right, we're moving back to Oahu, but nope, we'll move back to Hawaii Island. And my wife's from uh, uh, Honomu. So that was in 1990, the end of 1990. And that was right around the time <clears throat> the state was doing you know, a project above the uh, old high school, the Valkilio Puna Forest. Uh, and in parallel, the company I, I hired on with was doing the 25 megawatt project here in Kapoho area. So uh, that's how it started off. I hired on as an operator, um, entry level in 1991. Saw a lot of exciting things throughout the years. Uh, and, and, you know, I worked through administration. I was part of uh, plant manager for some period of time and then uh, transition to business development which is what I'm doing today that's why they call me the senior director for ORMAT so, Ben time flies Marco amazing <laughs> Mike is there anybody there at PGV who has been around as long as you have my friend or are you are you the gray beard without the beard <laughs> So I am currently the longest tenured employee. There's a few others that are uh, in the 20s and close to 30 year um, employment uh, years. So I'm, yes, I'm the, uh, uh, I, I don't know, what I'm the old guy on the block. <laughs> well, and you bring, you bring, of course, uh, you know, uh, incalculable uh, Akamainas and wisdom, of course, just because of your time there and having seen seen so much. When you said LM2500, I kind of perked my ears up because that's a General Electric model, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And there are two LM2500s up the coast at Hamakua Energy, right. and I believe there's uh, two or more at Kehole, Kehole. that uh, Hawaii Electric Light uh, 
works uh, as well. So that's interesting. The LM2500 seems to, seems to get around both for stationary power generation, also for mobile power generation in the form of, uh, of naval vessels. Well, wow, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And as far as I, I understand, you know, the history of geothermal goes back to sometime around the 1980s when there was, a re you know, discussion going on, I believe, I don't know, 85, 86, and it took, of course, something of a gestation period to get to the point of getting the necessary permits and building and going online and so forth. So I believe in terms of actually being online, aside from volcanic interruptions, uh, we're going on what, 30, 30 plus years now? When did things actually start producing power there uh, in 1993? Yeah, we started in 1993 around the middle of the year. So uh, we actually started the plant up in April of 1993. Uh, then we, we, you know, we had to do uh, acceptance tests and capacity tests. And so it was a couple months later when we were able to declare commercial operation date. So right around the June, July timeframe. So yeah, this year marks 30, 30 years with the exception of um, the break that we uh, experienced during the eruption. I frequently say, Mike, without knowing the exact number, just because it sounds kind of impressive, which is that PGV operating for now 30-ish years has or has prevented uh, the need to import a gazillion barrels of oil <laughs> that otherwise would have been combusted in a turbine, right, or a right. boiler. Right. Do you have any, can you help me out here in terms of gazillion, of course, isn't all that accurate. Do you have kind of even a rough number of how many barrels of oil or petroleum products uh, has not needed to come to this island because of PGV? Yeah, uh, we do have that number, and it's uh, uh, slightly over 145 million gallons of oil displaced. 145 by million gallons, wow. 145 wow. million gallons, that's quite a bit. That is that is very impressive, and uh, you know, this is kind of a broad question, but let's see where you want to go with it. What difference do you feel that PGV operating these past 30 or so years has made to the Big Island's energy landscape? You know, uh, I think what we just mentioned about the displacement of petroleum is probably environmentally, you know, the, the, the largest contribution, right? I mean, today you look at greenhouse gases, climate change, we've been doing this for 30 years, even, even before when it was, you know, climate change was maybe just something that was just being discussed. So I, that to me is a huge part of it. Um, the fact that we have this facility here that provides uh, economic uh, support to our island, to the Pune district. You know, we have 31 full-time employees here working, earning living wages. You know, it's tough on Hawaii Island, right? To get um, um, employment that, you know, you can raise a family on. And so, uh, that also trickles down to the economic um, contributions we've done throughout the neighborhood, the community, you know, the schools nearby. We we go out and um, you know, purchase things from uh, the stores, and we rent homes, and we get contractors. So, you know, those those things are uh, to me uh, may may has made a difference, and will continue to make a difference on the Big Island. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, you know, obviously any power uh, generator that's going to sell power to the utility company has to have something called a power purchase agreement. You know, the terms and conditions, of course, of, you know, party A is selling power to party B. And that original power purchase agreement, if I'm not mistaken, that was up to a maximum of uh, 25 uh, megawatts of power. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So... The original power purchase agreement was uh, 25 megawatts in 1993. Um, because that we were fortunate that our geothermal resource was uh, much more productive than 25 megawatts, we uh, negotiated an additional five megawatt increase two years later in 1995. You know, so we went from 25 to 30 megawatts with the same equipment. And we're utilizing only the steam from the geothermal resource, yeah? So what, what we have here that comes up in the form of heat is uh, in hot water, which we refer to as brine and steam. 
and the original 25 megawatt uh, equipment was designed for the use of the steam fraction only. Um, so we had enough steam to go to 30, and that was 1995. And so throughout the years, we were not using the heated or the hot water, the brine. So it wasn't until 2012 where we negotiated an eight megawatt increase, and that's where we are at today, 38 megawatts. So 30 megawatts from the steam plant, eight megawatts from the hot uh, liquid or the brine plant. And Mike, also, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the the first 25 megawatts uh, are still being, or our PGV is still being compensated at the so-called avoided cost rate, which floats uh, up and down depending on the cost of oil, right? That's correct. So the first uh, 25 megawatts for the peak period is still tied to avoided costs. The first 22 during off-peak is also tied to avoided costs. The uh, Anything above that, up to 38 megawatt, are all fixed prices, anywhere from 12 cents to as low as 7 cents a kilowatt hour. And, and since PGV came back online, if I'm not mistaken, November of 2020, after the uh, the interruption due to uh, Madame Pele, yes. uh, so we're going on well, going on almost three years now that PGV is producing power again. What what is the peak output that you guys have been able to achieve post eruption? So we've actually gotten close to 30 megawatts for a short duration, uh, but. We've been experiencing um, some mechanical um, challenges on some of our wells. And so we have been able to perform capacity tests. I think that's 25.7 megawatts is the highest. Um, today, we are at about 22 megawatts because we're making adjustments to our well field. We just completed drilling a new production well, which will take uh, some time to connect to the plant. but it looks like it's going to be a productive well. We're hoping it'll be um, a good one. And uh, once we connect that, though, then we'll see how close we can get back to 38. We, our plan is still get to get back to 38 before the end of the year. Great. Okay. And as far as I know, whereas uh, wind farms on the island, such as uh, Javi Renewable Development there in North Kohala and Pakini Nui down at South Point, they are both uh, curtailable that uh, Helco can decide based on certain criteria to not purchase wind power produced. Uh, I don't believe PGV has, uh, you, you guys have never been curtailed, have you? Has it been, they've purchased everything that you've produced? For the most part, we, we are delivering everything that we can produce with the exception of when there's been a lot of rain. Um, there, there has been off peak periods where the hydro facilities in Hilo have uh, seniority on, on the pecking mm -hmm. order, the dispatch order, so to speak. So when they were providing a lot of uh, energy from the hydro plants, and this is off peak, of course, um, we, we were asked to be curtailed um, if, if the load wasn't just there. So we would be curtailed. Interesting. But, so hydro, hydro production is senior to geothermal production in that. Pecking in, order. That's interesting. I didn't know. In that. the PPA, in the P power purchase agreement pecking order. That's correct. <laughs> power purchase agreement pecking order. Yeah, a lot of a lot of P's there. <laughs> uh, uh, so so let's scroll back to uh, those fateful days in May, 2018. And I mean, I can only imagine uh, how it was like for you and the crew there as the lava seemingly was uh, surrounding the facility with uh, with a lava lake and i mean uh, i can only imagine how those days were for you guys i mean w w did you ever have much much fear that it was really going to be game over and that level of lava was going to keep on rising so that essentially you know all of pgv was going to be inundated or were you guys on enough of a kind of a rise that you thought you know as long as things don't get really crazy i think we'll be okay what was that like so it, it definitely was a once in a lifetime experience for all of us you know and um you know we we definitely were concerned i mean the eruption started on may 3rd in the afternoon of may 3rd in leilani however Weeks leading up to the actual eruption of lava to surface, uh, 
we were in very close communications with civil defense, USGS, because they were, they knew that the, the, the magma was migrating down the rift zone, right? And then once the once the lava lake just disappeared at Kilauea, it went somewhere. <laughs> and of course, you know, just being here and knowing people out in the community, you could you could just sense and you could feel the earth beneath you just like moving, you know, like like if you had an upset stomach and you had the gurgling. <laughs> That's how Mama Earth was treating us that time. It's very, yeah, it was such a, a un, unbelievable experience. Um, but getting to the point about being totally covered, we um, we knew that the well field, um, as far as elevation wise, are the lowest, and if anything, the well field would be the first uh, location. And these are the geothermal wells and some other equipment. So that would be the first location where if the eruption continued and produced more material, they would be covered. But if you got back to the original equipment and the control room, it's about a hundred feet higher at least in elevation. Mm -hmm. And so we felt pretty comfortable. And that was that was all in the design to build that equipment at a higher elevation in the event there is a lava um, you know, eruption. And so from that perspective, the developers of this project did their homework. Now, we know and our folks know that the rift zone, the east rift zone is very active. There's been eruptions in 55 and 60, right? And it's right along the lines of where we're at. And so what ended up happening is two of our geothermal wells got covered, two of our water wells got covered, and some of our equipment, including our drill rig, got covered by the, uh, by the eruption. But the rest of the plant was largely spared. Right. And so our thought process was if the lava was going to be as high as 100 feet more, all of Puna would be covered. <laughs> oh, uh, so, yeah. yeah, it was uh, exciting. Never, <laughs> never will forget those moments. That's for sure. And then, you know, Ormat's in business to make a profit. That's typically the, the way it works in, uh, in this capitalism society that we that we live in. Uh, so this rather serious uh, event takes place, which shuts down the possibility of revenue for mm -hmm. the facility for who knows how long. Right. You know whether I mean, and or and of course I don't know, but I would think that the the plant was was adequately insured, and the the, the folks at the top levels of Warmat, you know, had the decision: well, we're going to spend money to bring it back. And not, not knowing when bringing it back was actually going to take place, or you know, is are we going to call it a day? You know, after uh, after what twenty twenty five years or something? Uh, what's uh, were you privy to that? And why why did Armad decide to to march on in the face of uh, lava inundation? Good question, Marco. You know um, that that covers quite a bit of other questions that we were asked all the time uh, you know people ask well why, why do you build a facility you know on the most active volcano um and you know that, that that's something that we always say look the reason why we have the facility on the east rift is that's where the resource is at right so it's not much different than other facilities that ormat owns and operates worldwide we have equipment and facilities in Indonesia, in the Philippines, some in Iceland, uh, in, in Africa. And we've experienced, you know, Mother Nature, like covering up our equipment with ashes from a, a nearby volcano. And now this one was like a super duper experience, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> On this lava from 2018. So we understand those risks. Uh, we've had insurance. And so I personally would give credit to the leadership of Armad at the time, because the CEO, as soon as the eruption started and our executive vice presidents, they flew over to Hawaii. They gathered all of the employees and said, look, you guys, we don't know what's gonna happen. This eruption has just started, but we can tell you guys one thing. We'll promise to keep all of you unemployed for at least one year and let's see what happens in one year's time, right? And so, of course, Eruption started early May, late May, it surrounded us, so we couldn't get back on by land to the location. So we had several people flying in by helicopter and mm. taking time. But the rest of our guys, we volunteered at the at the, at the the hub in Pohoa. 
we volunteered, you know, our employees volunteered with the American Red Cross in KL all during this eruption. You know, and I give credit to the RMI leadership, the CEO at the time, his name was Isaac Angel. And uh, and so the, the folks at the very top level said, you know what? Uh, August, the eruption was officially uh, called you know, an end to it by USGS. And for Ormat to decide to let's go back in and recover and get back, you know, to doing what we do, which is generate geothermal electricity, I, I tip my hat to them. I mean, they could have easily said, yeah, you know, this is the end of it, right? And there was uh, lots of folks that stated that they thought this was the end of uh, a geothermal here. But again, our folks understand the risks involved with geothermal. We don't take it lightly, we take it seriously. And uh, we're fortunate, first of all, you know, for the employees here, for, for the island, for the state, that we continue to uh, work our way back up to 38 megawatts. And candidly, my candidly, I'm almost kind of embarrassed to say I was one of those people as well who thought there's no way, there's no way PGV is going to come back from this. And to your credit, to RMAT's credit, to everybody who has put their heart and soul and sweat into making this happen, uh, you know, yeah. you, you guys did it. And uh, let's kind of shift gears here. Okay. I mean, ever since people were talking about the possibility of a live geothermal plant on this island back in the 1980s, uh, there was opposition for a number of reasons, whether it's, you know, uh, desecrating Madame Pele because of the safety risks, whether if there happened to be some type of, uh, you know, catastrophic runaway event uh, or emissions. Mm -hmm. you now there's been opposition and there continues, sure. as you know, there continues to be opposition. Yep. And, you know, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't live in Pune. I'm, I'm not in a position to really come to a, uh, a considered judgment, but I mean, you've been in the, the hot seat there for for decades, and I guess my question to you is, just you know, if, if you look back historically over the past years and decades, have there been many events, minor or major, however that's defined, uh, as far as emissions that have. Uh, cause people to not feel well or become ill well, you know what, what what's the straight straight scoop on that mike from your sure. perspective yeah sure sure so yeah um when we when we speak about emissions the the primary um concern is uh, hydrogen sulfide you know, hydrogen sulfide is naturally occurring in the geothermal resource beneath the earth and hydrogen sulfide is formed naturally by the decomposition of organic matter right so that's where you get that rotten egg smell, organic matter decomposed. So you got that in our resource. And although the, the plant's designed to be closed uh, loop, meaning you know the, the, the production uh, heat comes up, we generate electricity, the cooler geothermal fluids are then rerouted back into the air to warm up over time. You know That's what the design is of the facility. But from time to time, we've had um, mechanical failures, a seal or a gasket. Um, one of the first uh, setbacks we had was in 1991 in June, when one of the wells that we were drilling was uncontrolled for 31 hours. That was the KS-8 well. And so you had this geothermal fluid uh, emissions to the atmosphere um, just for 31 hours, unabated, meaning it's not treated, right? So we have a system at the at the facility whereby if we release through the, the system, we we add sodium hydroxide and water and it chemically treats the hydrogen sulfide so that you reduce it you know, to a level that's very safe. Anyhow, back with that well, we, we didn't have that. So at the time, we probably had, um, you know, in the parts per million range out on our perimeter. And why I say parts per million is that since then, we have had to comply with the Department of Health Clear Branch. We cannot exceed 25 parts per billion of hydrogen. Billion sulfide. or million? Billion. With billion. a B. Okay, 25 parts per billion. Okay, got it. Per billion. If we exceed that, it's, it's a violation of permit. We can be fined. And you have sensors, 30, I would think, right? We have sensors around the facility, yeah. So over 30 years, 
I can count on one hand how many times we exceeded that 25 parts per billion, you know? And so, but to give you a more insightful perspective, OSHA allows employees to work in an H2S environment up to 10,000 parts per billion, not requiring safety gear. So you can see the perspective how we are regulated at a very nu nuisance level, okay? Mm. So, and I'll give you another example. In, um, in 2014, when Tropical Storm Izel made landfall here in Pahoa and Puna, we did have an upset. The trees took out the transmission line, so we had high pressure buildup. And so we went through our safety relief system, which abated H2S. However, we had safety valves, um, that a safety valve that failed, and it, it, it released, we calculated a little less than 100 pounds of unabated H2S in this big storm, right? The result of that is we had reports that over a dozen people passed out, over a hundred people got sick in the area in this big storm, right? And so we, we went and did like community discussions with civil defense, with Department of Health, with Helco, myself. So now take us to 2018, right? So we got all these fissures, 24 fissures south of us. It's, the emissions is sulfur dioxide, like how we see up at the crater, right? When it's really booming up there. Sulfur dioxide is considered to be five times more hazardous than hydrogen sulfide, respiratory perspective. During the heyday of this eruption, the fissures next to us emitted 400 million pounds per day. And no one reported any illnesses. Just comparison. I don't know what to don't know what to say to that. That that is quite the comparison. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, for that explanation. And uh, let's um, let's move on to kind of bring us up to speed, Mike, as far as okay. where we are now in 2023. There is an amended and restated power purchase agreement that is in play between yes. you and and the Hawaii Electric Light Company. And uh, please tell us about that and uh, why, why, why should we care about that? <laughs> well, so, <laughs> you know, the state's uh, mandate is to get off of uh, fossil fuels, right? There's so many things going on, but first and foremost, what, what happened some years ago uh, during Governor Ige's first uh, term was uh, he mandated that the state reach 100% renewable energy by 2045. So we're a big part of it. I mean, before the eruption, um, Hawaii Island was close to 60% renewable energy and PGB contributed about half of that, about 31%, right? And so we were like on a roll there. We're like moving our way up to the nearer to the 100% um, mark. Um, so now, even before the eruption, we started discussions with Hawaiian Electric about doing a repowering project. Basically, what we propose is that we would install three newer, more modern and efficient generating units, decommission the old 12 units that we have, use the same geothermal resource because they're so newer and efficient. It would enable us to generate eight more megawatts, the same resource, smaller footprint, modern equipment, the other thing is we're, we're talking about all pricing being delinked from oil, no escalation and for another 30 years. And then combine the, the two PPAs that we had into one, you know, one consolidated uh, power purchase agreement, amended and restated power purchase agreement. So the PUC actually approved that original application that was done in December of 2019. Took some time. It wasn't until March of 2022nd that we received a conditionally approved ARPPA. The primary condition for PGV was to perform an environmental review. And so we've opted to perform an EIS, or environmental impact state study statement. So we're doing that. Uh, we cannot do any construction until that's completed. And then we're also uh, in the process of, of reviewing, well, we, we worked with Hawaiian Electric who um, submitted an application for an amendment so we're asking for an increase in the in the pricing because of 
what had happened during COVID and the supply chains and you know everything just uh, dramatically changed in, in, in you know during that COVID period time. So that's still going on. Hopefully, we can get a decision from the PUC um, within you know b- before the end of this year, and in parallel be completed with our EIS. So the sequence, as I understand it is PGV will be submitting the environmental impact statement to the, uh, the, the accepting authority or agency, which in this case is the County of Hawaii, correct? Uh, correct, County and, is accepting authority. And they will be, I guess, uh, yay or nay, up or down, hopefully up. And then that information essentially is transmitted to the, the, the PUC that uh, PGV has fulfilled that, that particular stipulation. Correct. And then it's up to the PUC to give final, I would think, final approval for this amended and restated power purchase agreement that will be for all 46, you know, max 46 megawatts at a fixed price for all output, whether it's a one megawatt or two or 10 or, or 40, and that there is no escalator over the course of that 30 year EPA, correct. correct? Yes, correct. And then once that approval is given, sometime later this year, fingers crossed, then PGV has a certain amount of time to be able to ramp up to that 46. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And you have what I think you shared with me before, three years? Yep, so that's that's what we're um, requesting in the approval is 36 months. Uh, We anticipate doing it quicker than that, but we just want to get some you know way in, in case we get more supply chain considerations and just you know because obviously i've got some electrical background here as you're driving uh you know from um Ke'au into puna you see a pair of high voltage transmission lines which go into the puna district and is it correct to assume that um, even going up from to 46 megawatts max output, that the infrastructure that Helco has in place uh, right now is adequate to be able to handle the additional output from your plant? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, there's the two transmission lines and uh, they both are um, able to handle up to the 46 megawatts by itself. So we got some redundancy there. So yeah, we had to do some studies for that. So, I mean, given, I mean, if, if I, you know, if I asked you, okay, Mike, back in November of 2020, now that you were back online, you know, where do you think you're going to be, let's say, several years hence in 2023, as far as um, uh, peak output? Uh, I don't know what you would have said, you know, whether you would have guessed on the low end or the high end, but I mean, it's, uh, you know, still somewhere in the 20s now. I guess what I'd like to ask you is how confident uh, are you and your team that uh, in the 36 months after approval from the, the commission, that mm-hmm. you all will be able to hit that 46 megawatt target. Right. So I, I, I would say that our confidence level is very high. Um, the key is, of course, um, getting back to um, our 38 megawatts today because then we have the resource, right, that we need. Uh, to do the 46. Uh, all, the, all the manufacturing, of course, going to take time. Uh, the big equipment, the generators, we, we do a lot of that. So we have a high sense of uh, confidence that we can accomplish it in within 36 months. Great. That's good to hear. I'm going to wrap up with a, with a speculative question for you, Mike, because I really am going to be curious to hear your response here. Uh, as you're well aware, there there is... Um, there's a certain uh, a cohort of people on this island and in the state that see the geothermal potential here on this island as being vast, right? So vast that not only could it produce a heck of a lot more power for Big Island residents, but that over time, geothermal from this island could power the rest of the state. Now, I have some rather strong views on that that uh, I'm going to hold my tongue for now. And I wanted to get your take on, because I mean, brother, you, you've heard the same stuff that I have had, have been hearing over the years that CGO thermal is almost kind of a, a panacea 
you know, and if we could just put the power cables from Maui, then Maui to Oahu and so forth and so on. Well, what's your take about that? You know, I, I, I wish it was as simple as how some of those thoughts come across to everyone, you know, and it's not. I mean, look at us, right? We've been here 30 years and we're, we're still ch challenged to get back to 38 megawatts. Now, there's been, there's been studies um, throughout the state. Uh, there's the um, Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resource Center, right? That's been established under the University of Hawaii who has done some preliminary work uh, statewide, Maui, uh, Lanai, Oahu, Kauai. So the potential is there, Marco. What, what we haven't done is spent the money to actually do some, some geothermal drilling to prove if a resource is viable or not in different locations other than the East Rift Zone of Puna, right? To me, that's the key. And we've been an advocate. We've been hoping that the state will step up because the state has these mandates for energy. The state's going to have mandates for reduce, you know, net zero carbon and and all that. The state has claim to the mineral, right? As 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 the mineral rights, they own it. We should be like how the oil states do in the mainland: is go and and prove up the resource, have them ready. So when we need the electricity, it's right there. So it's going to take time. It's going to take money, and um, I, I believe there's enough energy to power up. Now we wouldn't want to put all of the plants in Puna. Let's move them around because why? There's going to be more eruptions in the future. We got to plan for stuff like that. Well, I, I've heard, Mike. I've heard, you know, people like Don Thomas and others who have uh, said that whether it's perhaps along the saddle road going between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, whether it's the slopes of Hualalai, that there are other possible feasible practical geothermal assets, resources on the island. So, I mean, the, the obvious question to me is, which I don't have an answer to, maybe you do, why has there not been more surveying done to be able to nail that question down as opposed to, well, we might have mm -hmm. a usable resources resource versus, hey, we've tested it. We think we do have that. I just don't get. Right. Right. So I, I don't either. Uh, I know there's been some efforts at the at the legislature to to um, appropriate funding to do that type of research uh, by the. Um, Hawaii ground, you know, the Dr. Thomas and Nicole Lautz's group. But so far, that has not been successful. I understand, Mike. And I'm, I'm getting the hook, getting the hey. hook from the producer. We're over okay. budget here. But <laughs> hey, uh, you know, you and I could go on for a while longer. But uh, I'm, I'm so very grateful to have you on, Mike. And uh, please, uh, let's, let's agree to have you back before too long because uh, there's, there's still such more juicy stuff to talk about. So Mike Calagini, Senior Director of Puna Geothermal Venture, mahalo nui for joining us. Thank you, Marco. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.